Hello people of the internet, how's it going? My name is Ryan, and let's talk about my experience with the base model 2020 13 inch MacBook Pro. I'm going to start off by saying that I am in no means a power user. In fact, I'm still quite new to the macOS experience and what it really can be capable of. However, that's no excuse to really have ignored the progress that Apple made over the years and I recently began to see the benefit of using a Mac. I use a Mac nearly every day now, thanks to the 2007 MacBook that gave me a real chance to try out the operating system to see what did and didn't work for me without the fear of losing a pretty significant amount of money for that trial run. From there, I moved on to that 2011 MacBook Pro, complete with its now disabled discrete GPU. It's still a great machine for light tasks and it is kind of capable still. My desktop experience has been altered as well. My 2009 iMac is what I'm writing this video script on and is how I use most of my admittedly small desk space. These examples of my introduction and evolution into buying Apple computers have all been, well, used. Sure, they still function and I've added parts and upgrades to make them more complete and more usable and I love them all, but this is my first new Apple computer. That being said, I'm in love. The last computer I owned new was a really crappy Dell laptop that I bought at Best Buy for $150 total, including tax, a couple years ago. Sure, it was a decent machine for light web browsing and was super small and portable, but I kinda got what I paid for. 32 gigabytes of storage, expandable with a micro SD card slot, a tiny battery, low power processor, and of course, a Windows experience. That's not to say Windows is bad, I use Windows on my tower PC and it's a good time for gaming and I'm happy it exists but it ran horribly on that Dell, so I switched over to Ubuntu Linux and it feels pretty capable now. But I feel like we're getting off track here. This video is about a Mac after all, and I gotta say, I kinda think I missed out over the years. When I did that potato quality unboxing for the MacBook Pro, there was something missing. You know, besides a decent camera, camera angle, lighting, and other things like that that make a video decent. I didn't show my face to exemplify what I was feeling as the box cover slipped off. Apple nails the unboxing experience in my opinion, and man, it was fun. Getting to the computer itself, we have the color, the space gray. While it's a different shade of space gray from a different era in Apple's history, one that still included the iPod Nano and iPod Classic in their lineup as seen here, is straight up beautiful. Yes, I know, the iPod Classic isn't technically space gray, but it's so similar because it was kind of the baseline for what space gray would become. The gray on this computer is a pretty stark and welcome contrast in comparison to my other MacBooks, especially the white plastic one. Speaking of which, we can see just how far Apple has moved along in regard to how thin and light their computers have become in the last 13 years or so. From a big chonk and heavy beastie, to an even bigger chonker, to a thin and light but still probably about 3,000 times more capable pro laptop, the only thing really missing for me is, well, the ports. Oh no, here we go, another review of a recent Apple laptop that's going to complain about the ports. Except, not really. I have a couple adapters that get done when I need to get done, sure, but in all fairness, if I want to do something that involves a legacy port, I'll use one of my other machines that has the legacy port. Need USB Type-A? Grab one of the older MacBooks that I have, or my iMac. If for some reason I need FireWire 400 or 800, use one of my old MacBooks, and they're up to the task just fine. So to clarify a little further, everyone's use case for a computer is going to be different. That's just how it is. Some people would find it incredibly silly to keep an old computer around just for the old ports. I have a specific reason why I need these computers around. For example, my 2011 MacBook is where my entire 40 gigabyte plus iTunes library is stored. I don't really feel like I want to take the time to port that over to the new machine because that's all space that I can use for video files, important documents, and really just keep the computer as clean as possible. If I can have a separate machine that I can just load my iTunes library onto and sync one of the 30 plus iPods that I have, yes I know, I'm weird for that, it's easier for me. Rather, I've already spent the money so I might as well just use the equipment that I have. And for some, again, that don't seem silly, but for a lot of us, that's what's necessary. So something that this 2020 MacBook Pro has that my other options don't is this display. Wow. At 2560 by 1600, I can say for pretty certain that I haven't really treated myself to the best of screens until this upgrade.
I had seen it when I would go to the Apple Store and goof around with one of their demo units, but this thing I feel really needs to be seen up close to be believed. Different. Crisp, fluid, bright, but also super dark when you need to tone it down a bit, like at night. This display is one of the best I've ever seen on a laptop personally. Also somewhat stunning to me, as I had never used one prior, is the touch bar. Controversial, I know. It does take a bit of time to get used to the basic functions of it, like using it for brightness and volume controls, but the fact that it can change and adapt to whatever application you're currently running is a really neat feature, especially in a laptop. Sure, I still miss the row of physical function keys, but I've since learned it's not so bad to have the touch bar, especially when getting a virtual row of those function keys is just a tap away. Moving on to the keyboard, this was a major selling point for me, and one of the main reasons I chose to buy a new MacBook in 2020. The Magic Keyboard is reminiscent of the one found in my old iMac wireless keyboard and my 2011 MacBook Pro, but with a little less key travel and a more definite feel upon key press. One major selling point for me on the Pro over the Air was the processing power and cooling. Now I knew at the very least I wasn't going to get a top spec model anything. My current computing needs just don't call for it. I also didn't want to end up overestimating what the Air would be able to do in case my needs did change. It took me about two weeks to make this decision because the Air was released at such a good deal for what it is, but with the lack of cooling in the 2020 Air, I could not trust the thing not to die in me in a year or two if I ran it too hard and always had to have the fan ramped up in max fan control. Yes, I said fan, because there's one. At least with the Pro, there's a bit of a better cooling system, but yes. that being said, there's only one set of vents on the Pro located underneath the hinge on the back of the computer. It seems that these will be best at heat dissipation when on a desk or another flat surface, as when I was using this computer in bed, it got a little toasty because of where I had the computer sitting, was blocking the vents a bit. Now while I don't really feel it's my place to do a big technical deep dive and do a benchmark on this computer, as you can find that plenty of other places, I will have to say, in the words of Steve Jobs, this thing is a screamer. And at the $1300 I paid for it at Micro Center, an approximate savings of $90 over Apple's own website for some reason, wink wink. I think this computer is a total winner and something that I can see myself using for at least the next three to five years, maybe even more. Anyways, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. If not, you're more than welcome to give it a thumbs down, that button still works too. Uh, if you like what I'm putting out and would like to see more, please subscribe. I hope to put out more videos for you all. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you later.